Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, yeah, I'm one of those guys. All right. So those of you who don't know me, hi. I am David Brezina. I'm the new pastoral intern here. And today, I'm going to just give you my testimony so that you guys get to know me a little bit better. So my testimony is my story with God, just how God has been seen working through my life. And then I'm going to give you a short message. And I'm going to say this now so that you can hold me accountable. There will be a time for a Q&A. You can ask me questions about myself, and I'm not going to run over, and there will be time for a Q&A. So, real quick, got some pictures here. This is me and my two younger sisters. Uh, this was taken last week. Uh, so, that's me in the middle there. And then my younger sister, Emily, and then my middle sister, Kaylin, right there. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm a huge Yankees fan and Patriots fan. So I'm sure everyone here could relate. Uh, so here is a picture I mainly included so you can all see my dog. I love my dog. That's Scout. He's a little border collie. Uh, there's our family cat. I don't talk about her too much. And there are my parents. If you want a better image of my parents, they're also sitting right there. Oh, yeah. Uh, my mother drove down yesterday, and my father surprised me when I was in here doing stuff in the church. He walked in. So that was a great surprise. They drove down from Connecticut, which is where I'm from. So it's about three and a half, three hours, 45 minutes away. So from you, that's re- for some of you, that's really close. For some of you, that's really far. In Pennsylvania, I guess that is pretty close because your state's huge. In Connecticut, I could drive anywhere in one hour. I could hit the whole state. That's not the same here. Uh, So here's another picture of us. We like to travel a lot. We do a bunch of road trips. So this was a road trip to Boston. My mom, my two sisters, me. Uh, There's my girlfriend, Sammy. She's also here. You have all probably met Sammy. We were here at VBS. And this is my sister's boyfriend, Costa. He is kind of now part of the family. He is, he has been dating her for what, three years, four years now? Yeah, so that's him. And so if you look right here, that's my friend Sydney Shaw in the back, right there. And right here, this, uh, this man is Stephen Gallagher. You guys probably don't recognize him. You probably will get to know him. He is my mentor for ministry. So he will be around, hopefully watching some of my sermons, coming around. And that's just a better view of my girlfriend, who some of you might know. That's Sammy. And then that's me in the middle. And then... That is just a picture of all of us when I graduated. I just graduated from Messiah University about two and a half, three months ago in May. So I'm pretty new to the adult world and taxes and student debt. That's all very new to me. But I am very glad to be here. So I'm going to leave this picture up as I just tell you guys about my life and how God's been so, so good to me. So I grew up in a home, a loving home, a lot of love to give with the five of us, and we always had animals and whatever friends were in the neighborhood, our door was always open. So there were always more people than that, but that is my family. And we grew up in a Christian home, but for the most part, it was Christian on Sundays. We didn't really do too much aside from that. Kind of went to church, left the church, and then go live your life, go be free. There were youth groups at certain times. It was pretty sporadic growing up at least in my childhood, mainly because the church I attended was an average attendance of about 15 people per Sunday, not just per service, per Sunday, was 15 people. And all those people, other than my siblings and my parents, were above the age of 75. So there was not much youth going around, not many youth events, So that's the church I got confirmed in. So you got baptized as a baby, you got confirmed in that tradition. And so I was confirmed at the age of 13. And I remember getting confirmed, and we were going through all these confirmation classes. And I remember just learning a lot about God. Like, we would sit there, and we would read the Bible. We had memorized the Beatitudes. I don't know them now, don't ask. And, like, the Ten Commandments and all that different stuff. And I remember knowing a lot about God. And being like, wow, 
Like, this must be what it feels like to be like a real Christian. Like, I'm learning so much. I know so much about God. So I knew a lot about God. I can't say I really knew God. So after confirmation class, uh, you were officially an adult. You were entered in as a member of the church. And then being a member of the church, you had to do all the memberly things. You know, you had to go to the board meetings, the budget meetings, all that. So I remember being 13 years old. So what, eighth grade? And I just got confirmed. And then two weeks later, there was a budget meeting. And I remember sitting down, so excited, like, I get to vote. I get to do my first thing as a Christian. And then there were these two old ladies just bickering about how much we're going to give to the missions budget. Like, oh, we're going to give, like, 7000 or 10000 And they're just bickering back and forth. And I go, I can't count that high. <laughs> I remember thinking to myself, that whole meeting was basically that. It was just a bunch of people bickering and talking about money. And then some people got really hostile, too, about it. And I remember sitting there thinking, I don't know anything about money other than what I have in my piggy bank. And so if that's what it means to be a Christian, then Christianity is probably just for older people. So I was 13. I was like, okay, I don't really understand what's going on. But I do kind of understand the church is for adults only who understand money and understand politics and the board meetings and all that. So I'm just going to step away from the church until I become an adult. That's not really the best idea, but also I didn't know any better at the time. So I just poured out kind of my time into school. I went to public school, and I loved public school. I knew everybody in my town. We are a little town for Connecticut, so it's about 17,000 people, 17,500-ish. I knew everybody there. I was everybody's best friend. Uh, all my neighbors on my street would call me the mayor whenever I'd ride my bike down to see them. I was the mayor. Everybody said, oh, here comes the mayor. So I kind of really got to get involved in a lot of things. So in high school, I ended up being in 12 different clubs. I was the president or captain of like eight of them. But so when I was 13, kind of left the church, 14 going to high school, I said, hey, I want to start playing football. My best friend played football. I want to start playing football. So I started playing football. I loved it. I loved the guys. It was fun. But it wasn't really the best atmosphere to be around. I really noticed myself falling into times of swearing a lot, uh, womanizing, kind of having this idea of being okay with kind of whatever the upperclassmen did, which then we called rituals. Now I reflect and see it was hazing, and it definitely did push far past the lines of assault of other people. And I remember just being in that environment all the time because practice was six days a week, every week, even in the off-season. Sometimes you got a break in the off-season. Sometimes they give you Saturday off, most likely not. But I remember being in that environment, and then there was one kid who came up to me and said, hey, I hear you're a Christian. I go, yeah, I am. I know so much about Christianity. I know how to budget. (laughs) Uh, And he goes, hey, well, I want to invite you to our youth group. And so I said, yeah, sure, I'll go. So we went to this dude's youth group, and it was a very large, it was a God church. So about 1,000 people a Sunday. I remember walking into the youth group, and it blew my mind to see 20 other kids there. Like, there were other kids going to church. What? That was so crazy to me. So I walked in, and the youth pastor came up, greeted me. I'm like, a youth pastor? You have room in the budget for more than one pastor? You have more people that you need another pastor? More than 15? So I remember the youth pastor come up to me, meet me. He was super fun, super energetic. And then he got on stage and he preached this really fiery service. And I was blown away. That was nothing I've ever experienced church to be. People came up here and there was a, there was a guitar. I remember watching these people go up. And then one person picking up a guitar. I'm like, what do we use that for? I don't know a hymn with a guitar in it. <laughs> and, and they played this lively music and people actually seemed to 
A, want to be there, but B, love one another because there's this thing that they loved more that they wanted to show other people. So I ended up attending that church until probably the, until through college. So until college and then throughout college when I was home, I attended that church. And I was going there every week. And I'm like, I don't know what keeps bringing me back here. I don't know if it's some of the pretty girls in the youth group or if it's something else. But something keeps bringing me back. And I remember going, going, going and actually starting to understand, like, hey, knowledge of God isn't knowing God. Knowing God is something that is so different. It's, it changes your life. It takes you from this life that you're living, which you think is life, but it's actually death, and brings you to life. It's like a breath of fresh air whenever you breathe in, knowing that you are loved by someone who's willing to die for you. And so when I started to wrap my head around that idea that someone would die for me because they loved me, and they still continue to pour out into me, that was crazy. So I would keep going back to this youth group, and eventually I did give my life to Jesus at that youth group. And I'm like, wow, I got to share this with the world. So I went back to my public school. I said, hey, I want to start a faith club. And the principal almost smiled because it was so funny. He goes, dude, this is a public school. And I said, okay, listen, what, what can I do that could possibly get this passed? He said, well, from every club that is started here, we require a bylaws and a constitution. And I said, okay. So I went home that day after school, and I was a senior at this point, so senior high school. So me and my sister, who was a junior, so she was a year behind me, the one on the right there, we stayed up really late until like 11.30 or 12 and typed up these bylaws and this constitution. I did it all that night. And I went in the next morning, I put it on the principal's desk, I said, here you go. And he was telling me how, listen, this is a public school. Most clubs to get passed, you know, I got to bring it to the Board of Ed. They all have to review it. They got to vote on it. Typically takes six to eight weeks for a club to pass and be able to be led at the school. But especially because this pertains to faith in a public school context, I'm looking at, nine to 11 weeks. And so there was like six weeks left of the school year, maybe seven. So I said, okay, I'm not going to see this passed, but at least my sisters could carry it on. Like if it gets passed over the summer, like they can do it. And so I submitted, I said, yeah, that's fine, whatever. And I was just walking down the hall three days later. My principal pulls me aside. He goes, did you hear the news? I go, no, what news? He says it passed three days later. Like, nothing else, I, like, I, like, like, I don't know, unless they were just really on top of things. I highly doubt the public school system. Board of Ed is, in that context pertaining to clubs, in three days, it was passed. And he said, you could start whenever you want, it passed. You want two weeks to think about it? I'm like, no, we're starting Monday. So that Monday, we had our first meeting, and it's still going on now. The teacher who's like the supervisor for it. She's fantastic. She sends me updates periodically just about how well the club is doing and how God is working in that public school, which is just amazing. But that wasn't enough of a sign for me. I'm like, ah, ministry still isn't my thing. So that was senior year. So I don't know if you guys have kids or even experienced, there's a May 1st deadline when you apply to schools. So by May 1st, you have to declare where you're going. So I, my original plan was to become a cop because I remember all I wanted to do was help people. I wanted to help people and somehow through helping them show the love that Christ has for them just like he has for me and has done in my life. So I remember sitting down with my youth pastor and he's just like, like I'm just like, dude, I don't know what I want to do. And he goes, hold on, just tell me, like, what do you want your life to look like? I'm like, well, I want to help people. I want to show people Jesus. I want to be involved in a community. He goes, dude, it sounds like you want to be a pastor. I said, nah, that's not it. There's no way. He goes, no, dude, like, for real, it sounds like you want to be a pastor. I'm like, where are you getting that from? Did you not hear my qualifications? 
does not apply to all of being a pastor. No, I said, I, I feel like you need to be called to be a pastor. And I just didn't experience that calling. So he said, dude, listen, you want my advice? You should go be a pastor, but a cop's good too. So I applied, and I was basically down to these two schools. So Roger Williams, which is the best law school in Rhode Island, and Fairfield, which is the best business school in Connecticut. So I was going to major in business, minor in law, and I was going to become a cop in that. I was going to race through the ranks faster with a college degree, and then hopefully become a town cop. That was my ultimate goal. Police chief? Nah, town cop. I want to be the one at all the sports games, all the fairs and festivals, interacting with the community. So it was April 29th, the day before May 1st. And I was praying all day. I'm like, Lord, like, which of these two colleges do you want me to go to? Like, they're both great opportunities. Which one do you want me to go to? And my normal discernment process is wait. If there's no answer, pick one. So I waited until April 29th. And that night I got in the shower. I'm like, Lord, I'm not leaving this shower until you tell me which college to go to. And right when I said that, he put the word pastor on my heart so clearly that I couldn't see myself doing anything else with my life other than being a pastor. Like, I literally got out of the shower, got changed, and I went up to my mom. I said, Mom, I don't even remember what the two schools were that I was deciding between. Like, I, Fairfield, maybe? Like, I, I couldn't even think of the colleges. So that night, April 29th, I applied to Messiah University, then Messiah College, uh, Valley Forge, which is in Valley Forge, and Eastern, which is near King of Prussia, PA. All in PA, because I wanted to be far enough away from home where they couldn't just follow me, but not too far where, they, where I could still drive home sometimes. So I applied to all three of those, and then May 1st hit, and I lost all my scholarships to every other one of my colleges because I didn't accept by the May 1st deadline. My dad, his eyes were like bulging out of his head. He's like, what are you doing? That's like $100,000 scholarship you just lost. But all three of those colleges accepted me, which they're not supposed to do. And on top of that, they also gave me scholarships, all three of them. And so I was really deciding between which one. I just felt called to go to Messiah University. So that's where I ended up declaring just a week or two after that May 1st deadline. Without seeing the college, I think. I think I just accepted. I didn't go to the campus or anything. And so about a week or two later, like before I'm going to college, it's about a month before I leave, this church that I got saved at, this big church, they had a youth Sunday where they had different youth come and preach at the pulpit. And so I was the last one scheduled for the last service. So just like this, I planned on running over. And so I went over there. And I, I got to the pulpit. I said, listen, guys, I know you wanted a shorter service, but I can't promise you that. I'm probably going to run over. So I started preaching my message. I had planned out so thoroughly, kind of just like why I got to where I am, why I'm going to pastoral ministry. And I remember preaching. It was on the story of David, David and Goliath. And I got towards the end of my message, and now I'm more prepared for this, but I definitely wasn't prepared when I was 18. I got towards the end of my message, and the girl in the back just started wailing. Like she was just crying and crying out loud, and I, was, and I just froze. And, and I, you know, I started stumbling through my words. I didn't know what to say until eventually I'm like, okay, that's it. And then the pastor came up, took the mic. He goes, okay, I'm going to pray us out. He prayed us out. We all left. Uh, and the girl just cried throughout the entire rest of the service. And someone came up to me, about five, ten minutes after the service and said, you know, that girl was crying. I go, no, I was on the stage. And she said, well, she has never seen God work and seeing how God works through the youth here and through you and your sermon, she gave her life to Christ right there. And so that was probably the biggest reaffirming moment of my walk. That's why we do what we do as Christians, but also me being called to pastors to help lead someone to Christ through the Holy Spirit, which was amazing. And so I'm like, wow, good thing the hard part's over. Now I got to go to college. So I went to college, 
and I was really excited. I was really ready to learn, really ready to get up there and, you know, kind of take the world on by storm. And I remember sitting down in my first class about the Bible, and the teacher gets up to the, the lectern, and he just starts talking, and I forget what he was saying, but eventually it leads into, like, yeah, and I believe most of the Old Testament is a metaphor. And I looked at him, and I was shocked. I'm like, why? Why? Like, what, what brings you to the conclusion that most of the Old Testament is a metaphor? And I really struggled with that. That was one of my two C's in college. The other one was in Greek. I can't read Greek. So I remember every day leaving that class struggling. And because there were always different ideas coming in, coming in, coming in. I just had no idea where they came from. So I turned around to the three guys behind me. and I said, are you guys hearing this or is it just me? And they go, yeah, no, it's crazy. We meet outside in like one of the study rooms at the college every day after class to talk about what was said in class and kind of debunk all the theories that we're hearing because it's just input, input, input. So I said, can I join? And they said, yeah. So I went and we just started to study and talk about the Bible and then it started pouring over into talking about each other and then it started pouring over and talking about our past lives, our current lives. And basically it formed into this life group, you know, this place where we could all come and air our dirty laundry. We could all come and be vulnerable with each other and love one another so well in Christ. And so that group kind of really got me through that class and then most of the other classes I had during college. And I remember thinking to myself, hey, like, there's so many people who don't have this, who don't have people to talk to, who don't have people to process with, and who just kind of ride the waves. You know, there's people everywhere that will just like sit in back, listen, leave, and then be left to like their own devices, which for processing information isn't helpful or good. So I went to the campus pastor and I said, hey, listen, this is a problem. And I think there should be a group to like help students process this theology. And she goes, oh, great. You want to start one? I said, no. <laughs> she goes, you want to start one? I said, sure. <laughs> so that was how I got my foot wet in actual ministry and doing things with other people. So I started a group called Sanctuary Faith Exploration and Missions. And the mission was to help students explore their faith and to wrestle with questions. Because wrestling with questions about God is not a problem. It's healthy. It's what we're supposed to do. But when you wrestle alone or when you wrestle with people that are only giving you one side and you don't really examine God or look for God in it, it just tears down people's faith. And I've seen that time and time again, sadly. So I started this group called Sanctuary where we would get together and do exactly that. And it was probably more for the leaders uh, when I started it because like most ministries, no one showed up for the first one. But the preparation that the leaders went through and then enabled them to have conversations on their own because you don't even have to have conversations. Like you could have a time, and if no one comes that time, it is what it is. But what you learn in preparing that time to take out like, the life change in your life is so much more important, and you'll remember that so much more than something you learned in a random class or group. So I started that on campus and kind of really found my stride in ministry. From there, I got a promotion. I applied for a job that was a little higher called the prayer director on campus. So I oversaw all prayer ministries and some of the worship ministries on campus. And I am just in awe, even reflecting on what God has done through different ministries, through lives of people that I've been able to pour out into and even through my own life. So with that, as prayer director, it also came with a lot of talk about prayer and worship and what does it mean to worship God? What does it mean to pray to God? Why do we pray to God? Who is God that we pray to? Then my internship, which I had, you have to get an internship to graduate and to be fully ready for ministry or really any job, kind of do an internship hands-on, was also in prayer. 
at a huge church, like 3,000 people. I was also their prayer director as an intern. And I remember just going to this group and praying with people who are in their deepest and darkest moments of life. And somehow, <clears throat> when you pray and when you seek God, just seeing the light and the joy that comes from seeking him. And so taking all that back into my context at campus just allowed me to really grow and pour out into people through prayer, but also through just knowing who God is. So I graduated college, and I was posed with the question that everyone who graduates college is posed with. What's next? Correct there, Mr. Dave Horst. What's next? I need a job. I'm in debt. All those fun questions. And so I was applying to different churches all around, and so I don't know how many of you know uh, Yvonne Nestor. She's right back there. Yes, lovely lady. Um, so I guess she was talking with Ted, or Ted was up here preaching, and he said, hey, we're still looking for a new pastor. <clears throat> and she heard this, and she goes, oh, I think my niece's boyfriend is going for some sort of ministry. So I'm going to text her to see if, like, he wants to apply or whatever. And so... Yvonne texted my girlfriend's mother, texted Sammy's mother, and said, hey, my church is looking for a pastor. Here's the pastor's number. His name is Ted. Tell uh, this young gentleman to give him a call. And so Sammy's mom texted me, or Sammy's mom texted Sammy. Sammy's mom texted Sammy. Hey, they're looking for a pastor at Yvonne's church Call Ted, here's the number. So the message that got to me in this large game of telephone was looking for a pastor, call this number. So I said, okay, and I called the number. <laughs> and so I called the number. He goes, hey, this is Ted. I'm like, hey, this is David. I was told to call you. He goes, ah, I'll call you back later in a meeting, whatever. I look, okay, okay, whatever. So he hangs up, calls me an hour later, and has like a nice 45-minute interview. He asked me about my theology, my history, where I've been working, what I've been doing, how am I called to ministry, all these questions on the phone. And so I answer them all, I guess well enough, because I'm standing here today. And then he asked me, okay, that's good. Do you have any questions for me? I said, yeah, what's the name of your church? Where are you located? What denomination are you? <laughs> Why, well, any information for the church will really help. And in classic Pastor Ted fashion, he goes, I got you. I'm just calling about your car's extended warranty. <laughs> <laughs> and then he told me, like, yeah, we're Grace Church in Schuylkill Haven. He goes, do you know where that is? I go, yeah, I do. My girlfriend lives there. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd have no idea where Schuylkill Haven would be. So then eventually through prayer, discernment, and a pretty drawn-out interview process, I made it here. And it has been amazing. This is my first full week officially working. I did work last week, but, you know, 4th of July and all that. So it's been great. It's been great getting to know you guys. I'm excited to get to know you guys more. And that's kind of where my testimony ends for now, but the great thing about testimonies is that God's never done with us. Our stories are never done, and you could ask me tomorrow, and my testimony could be completely different just because of the mercies that God gives us every day that we continue to build our testimony. So, now that you know a little bit about me, you should also know my favorite Bible verse, right? That's just the second thing you ask. So, my favorite Bible verse is Philippians 3, verses 7 through 11, which says, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider a loss for the sake of knowing Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. 
I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his, su- in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. So this is my favorite verse, verses, chunk of scripture. And I'm going to preach a little bit on it, but I'll also tell you why. So Paul starts with, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of knowing Christ. Whatever were gains to me. So Paul, I'm sure as many of you know, he started off as Saul, the great Jewish and Roman persecutor of Christians who would go out and find Christians who oppose their laws and their rules and he would kill them. And he was pretty good at it. Everyone was afraid of Paul in the Christian circles. Paul had everything he could have ever needed, everything he could have ever wanted. The law was behind him, both the law of the church and the law of the land. He had all the money he could ever want. He had all the servants he could ever want. He wanted a glass of milk. He'd just send one of his guys to go get it. He didn't have to leave his couch because I'm sure they had couches then. But whatever were gains to him, what were gains to him at one point, he now considers loss. So what was so good back then, he now looks back at with envy, considering it loss because there's something he's gained that's worth so much more, which is Christ. Now, if you continue on reading, what is more, he considers everything a loss. So not even what were gains to him, but everything. What is everything, you might ask? Even the stuff he's indifferent to, like, you know, three meals a day, water, a horse or a donkey to ride on when he's traveling these hundreds and hundreds of miles. You know, the things that, like, you're not like, oh, yeah, like, I have this. But, like, yeah, I have this. That's, that's good. That's good. We need three meals a day. Everything a loss. For the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He considers them garbage. Garbage. This is the only time this word for garbage is used in the New Testament. That's how, that's what he thinks of everything he's owned, of everything he has, of everything he does. He considers it garbage for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, his Lord. So you may be wondering if this is, wait, first time in the church, why is it and who is this Christ that he is knowing that he'd even consider normal things garbage? And I think that's summarized also by Paul in Galatians 2.20 when he says, Paul himself has been crucified with Christ that he no longer lives, so that I, him, Paul, may no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. That is the message that changed my life. The message that God gave his only son for you because he loved you and because he promises you life and life eternal. So if you look at this message, Paul looks at it and says, this is the message that everything else is garbage. Everything else is garbage. And so that's why I love this verse, these verses so much is because it's so practical. Like we could do it. Like I know how to do that. I know how to consider things loss. So I can fathom considering everything a loss, but it is so impractical. It's something we can always strive to do, to consider everything loss for the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. To gain Christ is to consider all else lost. Paul, being the good Jew and Roman that he was, had the law behind him. All the law, all the authorities, everyone was there to support him. I was like, yeah, Paul, you're doing great. Saul, 
Go persecute those Christians. He's doing great at it. You have anything you need, we got you. He had righteousness from the law. And even if he did everything right, which he did in some people's eyes, he had all the righteousness he could want from the law. But that's not where he found his righteousness. He found it through his faith in Christ. That didn't require him to do anything, but motivated him to do everything through Christ that comes from God. To know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his suffering. You know, they're not exempt. If you take one of the Greek translations to it, so there's, there's technically two ands, so it could say, to know the power of his resurrection, also the participation in his sufferings. Also. It's not a, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian now. I have the power of the resurrection. But it's you're a Christian now. You do have the power of the resurrection. But you also have the participation in the sufferings of Christ. Christ suffered so much to give us this power of resurrection. He suffered so much to give us eternal life, to show his love for us. We are also called to suffer, to participate in those sufferings. You know, in a world like today, it seems so easy for Christians to suffer. Christians, tr Christians can go out and so easily be the victim of what's going on in this world, which we can do and we are called to do, but suffering is a part of life that we are called to go through to join Christ in his resurrection and somehow attain to the resurrection of the dead. And somehow attain to the resurrection of the dead. Somehow, through a way that only God could think of, we sinners humans can obtain the resurrection from the dead through faith. How am I doing on time? Two more minutes? Okay, don't. Another hour? I'm down another hour. So, when I, uh, one of my favorite books I was reading, it's a commentary, it's not even really a book. I was reading about this kind of sums up why I love it so well. And says, therefore, so when talking about this chunk of verses, therefore, one should go back and read it again and again until what one learns in the analysis is absorbed in the passing worth of knowing Christ Jesus our Lord. Until we absorb our worth, knowing that we're worth nothing and nothing in this world is worth anything, compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. The future does not lie in the past, but in the future. And it is guaranteed precisely because it has already come present through Christ's death, to which we, present, to which we are presented and being conformed to his resurrection, whose power we will know and we will realize full at our own resurrection. By Gordon Fee. So when you read these verses next time and read them over and over, think, is your worth found in nothing but knowing the worth of Christ in your life? So, now I have allotted 45 minutes for Q&A. So if you have any questions about me, about my life, about my family, about this message I just gave, Feel free to raise your hand and I will put you on the spot. My favorite color is forest green, like a dark green, which is why Jess chose these slides. It's because it's kind of the green to the right of the screen. Yeah. I was confirmed in the UCC, United Church of Christ, which I understand you guys have a lot of around here. Yeah. Anybody else? Going once, going twice.
sold. I cannot play any instruments, but I could improvise pretty well, I think. <laughs> yes. Where did I meet Sam? So me and Sam met at college. Uh, she would say we met at a Bible study. But I was, so how that worked was there was a really large Bible study, like 30, 40 people. I walked in, I met everybody, and her, she was one of those people. So I don't remember her being there because I met a lot of people. So we met in class, if you ask my opinion. We had a class together. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, I will be around. I'm excited to be a part of this family and excited to get to know each of you. So I'm going to invite Dave back up to close us out.